Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance to give back to you. It just reminds us of how much you've given us. Father, in these next few moments, be with us as we focus on your word. Bless us through your spirit and not through my thoughts. And let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I think that today is called Pastor Appreciation Day. What that means is in 30 minutes, you're going to really appreciate staying more than you do now. Okay? Uh, I spent 10 hours yesterday building a, rebuilding a fence. <clears throat> and about 17 minutes planning for a sermon. <laughs> We're in trouble, right? And so I decided to put on Facebook, hey guys, just what you know, Pastor Stan is sick, he's got the flu, I'm preaching Sunday. And immediately start to get responses. People sent me scriptures. One, one family member, even who's a preacher, said, you know, uh, basically, you're in trouble, check your email. And he sent me a whole sermon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, which I have with me, by the way. So, so we might be okay. So I thought, you know what? Here's the really funny thing. Last Sunday, I decided, you know what? Next time I preach, I know exactly what I want to preach about. I, I figure I've got six months, maybe even a year to get ready. And man, it's going to be good. And then Stan gets sick. And I got no time to prepare. So we'll see if it's good or not. But it's what was placed in my heart last Sunday. So you're going to get it, okay? Now, everything I'm going to say during the sermon is predicated upon how I grew up. So I thought we'd start with that. And if nothing else, at least you'll get some good jokes. Okay? So, like the picture... Growing up born again. What's it like to grow up in a, in a family where your first, second, third, fourth, and fifth option during the week were all to be at church? How many been there? How many done that? All right, you know what I'm talking about, okay? When you walk into a typical conservative church, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever, there are some things you're going to notice right away, okay? First thing is some usher, ours is named Debbie, uh, is going to shake your hand and make you feel welcome. Then some usher is going to hand you a bulletin. Part of the process of getting you in the door and out of the way, okay? So you can get in here. Uh, and in that bulletin, it's going to give you a bunch of announcements. Don't worry, there'll be more. We always think of more, okay? And then that bulletin tells you what you're supposed to do during the service. And there's this little tiny thing called an asterisk. What's that in there for? Anybody know? Tell you when to stand up. Exactly. It would work. If the music leader would watch the bulletin, right? He always messes it up. But anyway, the purpose of the bulletin is to give you an update of the various activities in the church and to outline the order of service. It uses a code, okay? That code is that asterisk to tell us when to stand up, when to sit down, which is very important in church, okay? Uh, but what would be really cool is if there were a deeper, longer exp explanation or a bunch of codes for all the different things you're supposed to do during church. So... I read a book called Growing Up Born Again, and that, it had a list of things that, that should be identified so you visitors don't embarrass yourself, okay? First, there should be a plus sign in the bulletin, and that lets you know when every head's to be bowed and every eye's to be closed. Amen? If we just had a plus sign, we'd know, okay? Then there should be a percentage sign, and that should tell you, now this is the appropriate time to go to the bathroom or find a different seat. Okay? Wouldn't it be nice if that was in the bulletin? Right, Gary? Okay. Uh, then there should be a hashtag sign. You know what a hashtag is? You know, like that, okay? If we could have one of those, that would be the time it's appropriate to look around, see who's there, what they're wearing, etc. <laughs> it would be nice to have that, okay? Now, since I ran out of signs, we're just going to use multiples. So if there were two asterisks, what that means, it's appropriate time to rip your checks out of your checkbook, unwrap gum or candy, or tear off a piece of paper to play tic-tac-toe on, okay? <laughs> right? What, did I hit a nerve? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Or if there were three asterisks, okay, that's the appropriate time to meditate quietly and stop fidgeting. Okay? We need that. Oh, boy. Okay. And finally, the four asterisk sign. This is the time to gather your papers, gather your bulletin, gather your coat so you can sneak out during the benediction and beat those Baptists to the restaurant. <laughs> Gary, what are you laughing about? I've seen you do it. Okay, good. Now, 
Let's look for some more serious during the week signs that you, that you grew up in a born-again church, okay? So here, here are some examples. Number one, you find yourself praying for a parking space. <laughs> Am I the only one? That's what Stan says. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you find yourself praying for the good guys in a movie. Or the subtitle is, hey, wait a minute, why are you at the movie? Shouldn't you be at church doing something instead? Right? Okay, growing up born again, you resist walking into a highly recommended restaurant because of the neon beer sign in the window. Somebody might see you, right? Okay. Uh, or you make obscure Bible references at work, and then you realize everybody looking at you like you're nuts because they don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I'm the only one. Uh, you come home to an empty house, just for a moment you think, oh, did the rapture happen and I missed it? <laughs> Please tell me somebody besides me has done that. Okay, uh, and then finally, when somebody's about to get in your vehicle, you quickly turn on the radio and make sure it's not on that channel you should have been listening to last, okay? Just to be safe. Had all those experiences? A Couple little boys, eight years old, best of buddies, second graders or third graders, I can't remember now, One's Catholic, one's Methodist. And they wanted to go to each other's church on a Sunday. And they didn't dare ask their daddy because they just knew they'd be in trouble. Because, you know, you just don't go to a Catholic church. Seriously. Okay? And you should see what the Catholics say about us. <laughs> but finally, the dads worked that out. Okay, this Sunday you'll go to that church. Next Sunday you'll go to that church. But you have to sit with your parents and you have to pay attention. And so the first Sunday they went to the Catholic church. And oh, that Catholic eight-year-old boy was proud. He was looking forward to showing that Methodist boy everything that happens in the church. I mean, they had bells ringing, and they, they, were, sh they were shaking incense, and, and they were genuflecting, and uh, I mean, there was robes, and you were getting down on your knees in that little pillow thing, and that poor Methodist boy didn't know what to think. I mean, he was, his world was rocked. So he spent all week long thinking of what he was going to show his Catholic buddy at church next week, and he really couldn't think of much. So when they came in, he said, yeah, that's, that's, that's the usher. He gives us the bulletin. And, uh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, that's the acolyte. You let, and you let the, Catholic, the Catholic boy said, no, we have that. That's no big deal. Uh, they said, well, we take up the offering, and, uh, you know, we sing some songs. And there's, you know, finally something happened exciting, at least the Catholic boy thought. The, uh, the preacher grabbed his watch, sat on the pulpit, and the Catholic boy said, oh, what does that mean? The Methodist boy said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. So I told you, you at least get some good jokes. Now, what's really on my heart? Give us some scripture there, John. As a music director, this is one of my favorite verses. And I may read slightly different than the version you see because I'm reading from my Bible, okay? But here we go. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in work or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I wanted to talk for just a moment before I get into the rest of this, about the musical part of church, okay? And you see how it listed psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? I want to describe those three things to you. By the way, today is not a sermon. It's a, it's a teaching session. I'm teaching you what it is Stan and I do up here, okay? So, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Here's what that is, psalms. It's referring to the Word of God straight from the Bible set to music. Okay, we need that. We're singing God's Word. It reinforces it in our heart. We remember the words better when they go to music. Hymns. Hymns are words that are not found in the Bible, but that are written by people describing their relationship with God, their interaction with God. And again, they stay for generations and they help tie the church together because at the, at, when we're all hurting, we can all sing Amazing Grace together. When we're all praising, we can sing Praise God from whom all blessings flow together, okay? When we're in trouble, we, we have a song for that. When we want to learn something, we have a song for that. That's, that's the hymns. Spiritual songs, that's the part of the music that is designed to allow your emotions to relate to God, okay? 
Now, unfortunately, a lot of church have forgotten psalms. They don't sing the word of God anymore. Some have even set aside hymns. They don't sing the, the well-learned, tried and true, proven words that help us in our daily life. And they just sing the third verse, the third version, which is spiritual songs. And I call that the I love Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah crowd. <laughs> for lack of a better term, okay? In other words, you're all about emotion, but you forget that you're supposed to be learning at church. You're supposed to be helping each other at church. You need a balance of that. And so what you will see at our services, as long as I'm the one picking the music, you're going to see some psalms, music straight from the Bible. You're going to see some hymns, words that teach you and, and talk about the relationship with God. Okay? And you're going to see spiritual songs. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. We just feel good when we sing that. Okay? So all three of those areas matter. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways you can worship. And before I talk about corporate worship, I want to talk about all those other ways. And I want to give you credit where credit is due. Okay? Worship happens if the attitude is right while the janitor is setting up for Sunday morning. Did you know that? He's preparing the room, he or she, is preparing the room so that everything is just right for worship. That's his worship. Worship happens on Wednesday night when the choir is preparing those songs to deliver you a message from God in music. That's worship. Worship happens out in the hallways when you're welcoming people, making them feel a part of things, okay? That's part of worship. Worship happens when parents are teaching their children the importance of coming every Sunday. I would say to my dad, growing up born again, do I have to go to church? He'd say, no, you get to go to church. And I'd say, well, do I get to stay home? And he'd hit me. No. <laughs> Not really. He'd just say, no, you get to go to church. Okay? But parents, part of worship is teaching those children by the example. This is important. We do it every week. Okay? Obviously, part of worship is your private devotion time. Your prayer time. Your Bible reading. Your, your reading of, of Christian novels and stories that, that, you know, daily devotional guide type. All those things matter. Worship is Sunday school when you're learning more. You know what? Worship is even... When you do the work of the church, there is worship in selling knives or selling pecans or working at a fall festival. Why? Because you're helping to meet the need of the church. And that worship, as Victor early, earlier recommended, is deserving of what we're doing. Now, sadly, if I were to add together the number of people below 65 and above 65, that number might be higher, and then compare how much of that workaday worship happens in our church, the young folks would be sorely hurting. Because let's face it, it's our elders, and I'm pushing 60, it's our elders who get the work done around here. And some of us younger folks need to learn to help. Pretty sad when 55 means younger. Okay, we're working on getting, getting more younger people to come. But I want to honor that part. But that's not the part of worship I'm talking about today. Today I'm talking about corporate worship. That is the hour. My church used to call it the hour of power when I was a child. It's that hour when we focus on God. And that's what I want us to learn about and to get it right. Okay? Think about church. Uh, as a drama, for instance. Okay, just imagine you're sitting in a, oh, a theater. You have a stage, you have an audience, you have a lot of things going on. <clears throat> and all those things are important. And they each have their place. You got the actors up there acting, we're doing our part, right? And you got the audience out there watching and observing and enjoying, right? Okay. Now we have a problem. Because what I just said sounds like it makes sense, but it's wrong. And that's what I want you to learn today. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And quite frankly, that's the toes I'll be stepping on. Okay? Catholics were the only game in town from about 300 to about 1,200. 
okay, for nearly a thousand years and maybe more, there was one way to go to church, and that was the way the church said. Okay, and the way the church went to church was the priest and his assistants did their thing up on the stage in a language you didn't understand, and you sit out there and you better darn well be good, right? And you better give your money or you're going to hell. Most people in church didn't have a clue what was going on because church was being acted out for them. They weren't participants. One of the biggest things Martin Luther did for us in the, in the Reformation was to change that mindset from they do it for us to you do it for yourself. <coughs> no longer just in Latin. I want you to get a Bible in your language so you can read it for yourself and see what God says to you. Amen? Okay. That's the beginning of the reformation, the reforming, the changing of how church was done. We finally figured out that church is really about all of us. But yet, still we don't get it right. And I want to explain to you what a man named Soren Kierkegaard said. Now he lived from 1813 to 1855. So he died at age 42 and made more of a difference in how worship is to be perceived by Protestants, by all of us, okay, than about anybody else I've ever heard of. And this is what he said. Worship is a drama. Where's my stage? Where's the next stage? Oh, look at the seats, front and center. Let's just imagine what's behind that curtain, okay? The next thing to walk out is the actor, right? Wrong. My job is not to act for you. Why? Because you are not my audience. God is the audience in worship. Guess what? I'm a prompter. I'm the guy that stands over at the side and says, Now! You forgot your lines. Come on, you can do this. Stan, he's just another type of prompter. Because we are trying to get our audience of one, God, to see that we, the actors, get what we're doing here. If you can get that in your brain, everything changes from this point forward. You are the audience. I am the prompter. Right? No. God is the audience. I am the prompter. You are the actor. Say that. God is the audience. Up there is the prompter. Right here is the actor. Folks, that changes how you come to church if you take, take that to heart. Okay? Let me give you an example. Luke 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered into a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to the Lord's teachings. But Martha was busy. Martha was distracted with much serving. And Martha went up to, to the Lord and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, now I get myself in trouble. Last Sunday, Mary Lou and I had a dance. Okay? The music is the time for you to focus together corporately. God, we're all here. We agree. Listen to our words. Observe our hearts. Penetrate our minds and see if we're focusing on the one thing. That's how important music is. The third thing is prayer. Corporate prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. We say it together. Why? Because we are all acting out together aloud what Jesus told us to do. 
But we also pray with him when Stan's praying. Hopefully you pray with me when I'm praying. Remember, I'm a prompter. I'm not praying for you. I'm not praying to you. I'm being an example of what you should be saying in your heart and mind. Believe it or not, God can hear all of us at once. Okay? So if I'm praying out loud, what are you doing? You're either saying amen, amen, which means yes, Lord. Yes, I agree with what he's saying. Or you're saying for yourself, Lord, by the way, I... And then you fill in the blanks. So that's a part of our corporate worship. You got togetherness, you got music, you got prayer. Okay? The next you have is the sermon. Now you're going to look at the sermon totally different when you understand He's not here telling you what you should do during the week. He's here prompting you to do what you should be learning on your own. He's the prompt that says, remember in your Bible study you studied this? Remember, I'm reminding you, am I the only one? How often does he say, am I the only one? He's saying, I'm trying to relate with you so you can say, oh yeah, that's me. I need to be the one doing that. I'm the one that got that wrong last week. I'm the one that needs to be reminded of that so I can get it right. God, you're right. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll get that right. So think of him from now on as not just somebody entertaining you, because this is not about entertainment, folks. Sure, we go for the laugh. Why? It gets you to quit thinking about all the other things. Okay? We laughed early. Why? To get you looking up here. So we can all focus together on what God wants to teach us today through the prompters. But that sermon is vitally important because it's the, it's, you know, Stan works all week long to get it right. All week. To, cons to get down from 186 hours, whatever it is in a week, down to 20 or 30 minutes, what really needs to be said so that all of you, those of you who are retired, those of you who are working 30 hours or 30 hours more per week than you should, those of you with children and grandchildren you're taking care of, those of you with, with medical problems that we can't begin to understand, he has to say a message that prompts all of your hearts to take you where God wants to take you. So be supportive of what he's saying. Don't say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't apply to me, so I'm not listening. Because it does apply to you. And if you think that, it probably applies to you the most. Okay? So the sermon is the big prompt. It's the big prompt. It's the communication of God's word to us. It explains to us what God's will is for our life. We expect God to speak to us through his word by inspiring the speaker slash prompter. And we listen for what God is telling us. God's truth affects our lives and our hearts all week long. Sunday morning is just the replug. It's plugging that charger back in to get ready for the week ahead. Okay? The fifth and perhaps the most vital part of corporate worship is our response. I'm not ashamed to say I grew up Baptist. And in Baptist, we had at the end of the service what's called a invitation. What that means is kids are supposed to come down the line, down the front about once every three months and cry about how, how bad they've been doing and, and get forgiven, right? Oops, sorry. What it's supposed to be is the time for all of us while the singing is going on, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Invitation is supposed to be a time when we respond as the final act of worship to say, God, what you said to me through the sermon and through the music and through the prayers today was right. And I know what I need to work on. And I'm telling you, I'm going to do it. That's what the response is. That's what the invitation is. Now, it doesn't mean we have to walk down front to do that. You can do that during the song. You can do that when the pastor is still preaching and it pricks your heart. And now is the time for me to start praying, asking God to forgive me and to focus on what I need to be doing. But mostly, you can do it by walking out that door. And like I said last week, you are the church. Go act like it. That's the real response. Okay? That's the real response. The response can come in many different forms depending on the message we have heard. One way to respond is to do what God is telling us to do. Some people are doing this by serving in various capacities through the church, which we've talked about. Others respond with service outside the church, and some others respond by telling other people how good and great God is. Some respond by doing the priestly prompting duties that Stan and I do each week, that Shannon steps in and graciously assists when we need the help. Okay? 
hopefully all the responses put together will combine to do all of the work in God's church in McCutcheville, Indiana. Individually, none is more important. We need Debbie at the door. We need Martha in the booth. Right? We need Vera and Martha and Mary and Mary Lou, that whole group, working their hearts out all week long so that we can keep these doors open for God. But on Sunday morning, we need to stop. And when that switch goes on, from the busyness of the week, which includes announcements, some, it could even include the fellowship when we shake hands and everything, to when worship starts, we need to let the switch switch. Because if we don't, we are at risk. We are trying like a hot air balloon to lift our praise and adoration and thanksgiving and everything else to God, right? On Sunday morning. If we're not careful, we will take a giant spear of busyness and pop it. And we crash back to the ground. And then we have to start over. Folks, we need this hour. We need time to be together every week. Don't skip just for skipping sake. Be here. It matters. You don't know who's looking at you to say, oh, they're always here. They're faithful. Maybe I need to talk to them because I have a problem. That happens. They seek out people who they just simply see as faithful. We need to sing. We need to pray. We need to listen to God's word. Most importantly, we need to remember we must act. Throughout the hour and throughout our lives, we must act. We must set aside the busyness one hour for corporate worship. And please, when I jump your case about it, and I'm going to, trust me. But when that hour is over, we need to get back to the busyness of the entire week of serving God. What he calls each of us to do. Amen? Can we sing? And let's beat those Baptists to the restaurant. Would you come? <laughs> Would you stay? about to switch a gear again we're about to leave the stage we hope the actor enjoyed the show but we won't really know until the week is over because he keeps watching you lose your prompters now until, until next Sunday it's your job to prompt yourself go do what you know he wants you to do go be who he knows you want to to be. Go change the lives of the people that only see Jesus through you. And be back here next week for an hour of uninterrupted, focused relationship to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson. Thank you for reminding us that we're to focus on you and not ourselves and not the pastor and not anything else, just you. 
Right now we are focusing for a moment on our pastor because he's sick and he's tired and weary and the busyness of life has taken him over. Give him rest, peace, comfort, strength, and health. And now as we step into the busyness of the week, it starts in five minutes when the choir begins practicing for Christmas. And it starts when we get home, when someone calls and says, how was church today? And it continues tomorrow at work or with our grandchildren or with our neighbors when we are the Jesus that they see. Help our actors and actresses. Help me to make you proud this week. Amen. 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 Thank you.